that says like you're live on Facebook. All right. Yeah. Okay, great. Here we are. Welcome everybody. Uh, really excited to be here today. I'm Jen Saxton. I'm the founder and CEO of Tot Squad. And we are talking to Genevieve Colvin, uh, who is an internationally board certified lactation consultant, um, and really excited to share with you guys a lot of tips about breastfeeding. Um, going to do a Q&A, so if people have questions throughout the Facebook Live, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll get to as many questions and, as we can. And if we aren't able to get to everything, uh, we will come back through the chat at the end um, after the event is over and help you guys out. So. Uh, what we're doing today is as part of the Mom Kind project, which is something that the Boppy Company um, has partnered with Tot Squad to um, help educate and empower moms. Uh, they're envisioning a better world for all mom kind and supporting mothers without judgment, educating parents on safe practices, and empowering women to create the motherhood journey that is right for her. Uh, so we're really thrilled that they are bringing educational content um, like this session about lactation uh, to moms everywhere. So Genevieve, why don't I let you introduce yourself a little bit more? I'll introduce myself a little bit more and then we'll get started. Sounds great. My name is Genevieve. I'm a lactation consultant and I uh, work at a large uh, university-based hospital system here in Los Angeles and I cover both inpatient and outpatient but primarily our outpatient program. We have a state-of-the-art program where Every one of our patients during COVID-19 is getting a complimentary discharge telephone phone call after uh, to provide lactation support to their to them after discharge. And then in addition, we see patients and make sure that they're getting meeting their own breastfeeding goals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is super impressive. And then I have, I have a private practice where I also provide telehealth services. So previously, I used to go into the home, but during COVID-19, I'm mostly doing my work through telehealth. So I do that through Baby Live Advice. And, um, and then I have been providing volunteer lactation support through breastfeedingusa.org, which is a mother-to-mother -mother support organization. Um, like La Leche League or Breastfeeding USA, there's lots of great organizations of other mothers who have already breastfed, who love to help other mothers to breastfeed. And that's one of the, the basis of my foundation and lactation is that I like to make sure that mothers are meeting their own goals. Absolutely. And uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't share that Genevieve was actually my lactation consultant after my daughter was born almost two years ago. So it is wonderful to have this little reunion because I'm sure until your clients come back with another baby, you don't always get to do a check-in. <laughs> I don't always know. They, they get, we get them breastfeeding and they go out and they do it and I never always hear back. So it's lovely to know that everything, everything went well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I don't know that everything went so smoothly always, but hey, we, we made it. Um, That's great. So, <laughs> you guys were, were super helpful, and I was, I was delighted right. to have access to support and resources, um, especially through the hospital system where I delivered, which was awesome. Uh, so uh, like I mentioned earlier, I'm Jen Saxton. I'm based in Los Angeles. I'm the founder and CEO of Tot Squad. Tot Squad is a marketplace that connects new parents with all of the services that they need, including lactation consultants and uh, sleep experts, um, doulas, et cetera, you name it. Um, and I have been working in the baby industry for a decade now, and I have an almost two-year-old named Charlotte, uh, who I breastfed for about 16 months. Uh, so today we're gonna talk about what I wish I knew before breastfeeding, tips, tools, and products to make it more comfortable and fulfilling for mom and baby. Um, so Genevieve, I know that a lot of expectant moms and new moms have a lot of anxiety and fear around breastfeeding. Like I yeah. think it was literally one of the scariest things for me when I was pregnant was this fear, like, am I gonna be able to breastfeed? Am I gonna be able to do it? Uh, do you like know any stats off the top of your head or, or factoids about like what percent of women go on to successfully breastfeed? Or is this something yeah. people should really be worrying about when they're pregnant? Yeah, actually, that's a really great question because how do we measure success? And actually the United States has some pretty specific goals around this. And we have goals from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services uh, called the Healthy People 2020 and now 2030 goals, where they're looking at a couple of key uh, times when we want to make sure that women are breastfeeding to their own, their own um, successful goals. So in the hospital, we're looking for moms to be able to exclusively breastfeed in the hospital. 
without using any other artificial infant milks or anything like that at about 85%. So they want to. So we want to make sure that that about 85% of moms who come to the hospital who say that they want to breastfeed are able to breastfeed, and that, that only about 15% don't need to supplement with formula for other reasons. And we meet that goal here in the in um, in uh, the hospital that I work at. About 96% of women at, at the hospital that I work at initiate breastfeeding. And then about 84, almost 85% are exclusively breastfeeding at discharge. That's so amazing. not a lot of, it is amazing when you have a, a hospital like the one that I work at that is really dedicated towards following the 10 steps to successful breastfeeding as outlined by the World Health Organization, where we align certain hospital policies and practices to help the new mother to be able to meet her goals, we often find success. And then what's also really important is that there are times when there are medical complications that prevent a mother from being able to exclusively breastfeed, but we want to be able to protect her milk supply and we want to align the right services at the right time to help them leave the hospital and have a feeding plan that's going to protect her milk supply, but also feed the baby. And mm -hmm. that's one of the, the primary goals of the baby friendly hospital designation. Um, and that's one of the things that I've been involved with here in Los Angeles County, where we have a lot of hospitals. We have 54 birthing hospitals, more than most states even have, yes. And what's amazing about Los Angeles is we used to have two baby friendly designated hospitals that we have now more, more than 30. So finding a hospital that really supports breastfeeding that implements the 10 steps to successful breastfeeding is a really important first step. Now. Beyond the hospital, things get tricky because babies start to lose weight. Sometimes milk is a little delayed coming in and sometimes breastfeeding is painful. So the statistics start to drop off dramatically. So most hospitals I would say have a exclusive breastfeeding rate of about 65%. If we were to look nationwide, lots of, lots of mothers are supplementing for their own reasons, um, but that number starts to drop off pretty dramatically. And it's very few mothers that are breastfeeding to healthcare recommendations. The CDC does several uh, statistical analysis of breastfeeding through different surveys. In the state of California, we have a survey called the MEHA survey. There's another survey called the PRAM survey. There's lots of ways that states collect this data. And we know that about 25% of mothers actually meet the six month of exclusive breastfeeding. So it's really, that's the critical window is in those first two weeks after the baby is born. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. We actually got a live question from Jessica. Um, she's expecting her first baby in October and wants to breastfeed, but not sure if she's able to. Is there anything, any way she could know right now while she's pregnant, if she's going to be able to breastfeed? Yeah, so most women who are young and healthy, so less than 35 years old, young, healthy, not experiencing any um, kind of chronic health conditions like obesity or um, uh, diabetes or hypertension, uh, most mothers are going to be able to make a full milk supply. No worries. The older we become, the more kind of used our endocrine system becomes, sometimes we will have additional problems. But I have had 45 year old women with fertility issues who bring in a full milk supply. Mm -hmm. And I've had lots of, of different ways that we've been able to support them um, in that process. The other thing is, is breastfeeding doesn't have to be all or nothing. That's an important message that I like to give to mothers. Any amount of breast milk that you choose to give to your baby is the most beautiful gift that you can give to your baby. So I like to focus mom's goals around having a good time-based goal, which is mm -hmm. I would like to breastfeed to healthcare recommendations, which is exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months. And I'm going to give it my all for the first six weeks. That's what I usually suggest for moms. Focus on the first six weeks. Don't focus on the big long goals because it's the first six weeks that are the most tricky. Mm -hmm. So a couple of things for, for is it Jessica, to yep. think about is did she experience breast changes? Meaning at the beginning of our pregnancies, I don't know if you remember, but one of oh the- gosh, I was so times, sore. Yes, yeah, so sore. And that's because the sperm meets the egg and it starts to combine and then it turns into a placenta and a baby and the placenta embeds in the uterus. And the first thing the placenta does is it says like, turn on the milk makers. It even really gets the baby growing, right? The first thing the placenta does is says, like, before you even miss your period, you're, you're getting your boobs, the, mm -hmm. the factories going. 
And so if you have that tenderness at the beginning, if you grew like a bra size, it's a pretty decent uh, clue that you're probably going to make milk just fine. But research also supports that even if you don't have a lot of breast changes in pregnancy, after the baby is born, if you breastfeed extensively and often and early, that your baby will build milk tissue in that six weeks after the baby is born. So you're not even fully building your milk supply. It's not even completely done until that six week mark, which is why I, I, say, I had no idea. Yeah. yeah you got to focus, focus, focus those first six weeks. And it's a lot of feeding around the clock. Yeah, and I know I, I've, I've heard that advice before that like the first six weeks is the hardest and then a lot of moms, it gets a lot easier after six weeks. For me, it was a full 12 weeks. I feel like I was having yeah. a painful time and it was a real challenge and I was like in your office like once a week for, <laughs> for beyond the six weeks. Um, but I was really determined and it paid off for me because I had a really successful long-term breastfeeding relationship with my well, daughter. And I think you, you bring up a really good point about the fourth trimester. Mm -hmm. So- we think that we're only pregnant for nine or 10 months, but we're really pregnant for another three months after our baby is born. The only difference is that instead of a placenta growing the baby, our breasts are growing the baby. So did you know that we are carry mammals? So I always like to talk about this in my baby behavior classes. You may remember that Bambi in the Disney movie, Bambi is kind of alone. Like where's the mother the whole time? And that's because Bambi is a, a cash mammal, a mammal that is hidden away and is fed milk that's high in fat and high in protein. And Bambi's only feed twice a day. Deer only feed twice a day. Wow. But Dumbo and his mother, Dumbo can stand and walk at birth. And Dumbo is a follow mammal. He, Dumbo follows his mother and feeds like, I don't know, four, maybe five times a day. Not very often. Also milk, high in fat, high in protein. And then you have um, like 101 Dalmatians. And you have all of these little, very immature little puppies that nest together for warmth. And they're very immature at birth. And they feed more frequently, maybe six times a day. Um, and they make a milk that doesn't have as much fat and protein. And then you have Kanga and baby Roo and Kanga and baby Roo uh, is a carry mammal. And when little kangaroo joeys are born, they're like this big, this tiny. Really? Yep. And they crawl out of the birth canal up into the pouch and they attach to the teat and they start to drink milk and they actually continuously feed. And that's how humans are. We're carry mammals. We're meant to be carried and to feed very frequently. And so it's very normal in that 12 week period, right after your baby is born, for most parents to get very like frustrated by it because they're unaware of this normal process of babies needing to wake frequently, to feed frequently so that they can do this important task of socializing and learning. And every time your baby comes to the breast, the baby is learning an important life skill, which is how to interact with adults. Wow. Yeah. I love it. I've never heard that before. That was really fascinating. Um, yeah. There we go. We got our biology lesson for the day. Exactly. So, um, so can you share maybe any tips about how to help baby get a deep latch? I feel like yes. latch is one of the most common causes of pain for new moms. Maybe that's my perception. Yeah. But yeah, but yeah I want a baby to demonstrate because, oh, there we go. you know, one of my favorite things, this is my little baby here, is that parents like to hold the baby's head here and that actually often causes them to clamp down. So this part of the baby's head, which is the part that was pushed out first through a vagina mm -hmm. is tender. So just keep your hands off of the back of the head. And instead you can see the baby's ears Think about supporting the babies. I always say make a C and cut the cranium. And we want spine support because your baby's spine is the part that needs the support. Now, when you lay a baby on their back, they're going to be reflexive and they're going to go like, ah, like they're going to startle, right? So if you hold your baby firmly, belly to belly, chest to chest, with the baby's chin and cheeks touching the breast. And we start with the baby's nose opposite the nipple with your thumb opposite the nose. We hold our breast and strike a pose, breastfeeding both, right? Okay, so we wanna keep the baby very close, close to the breast. And it's really important if the baby uh, doesn't feel the chin on the breast and if you just wave the nipple in front of their mouth, they will almost always get a shallow latch. 
you just like, they will just get the tip. But if you point the nose and the nipple like this and the baby's chin touches the breast, they will go like this. And they will reach up for that nipple. Then the key is baby on breast. Now I know Boppy is our sponsor today. And so I wanna tell you, Boppies are amazing. And we wanna use them to support us after we have latched the baby. So sometimes we lay the babies on there and we kind of wave our nipple in front of the baby. And that's a great way to get a shallow latch. But if we pick up our babies, tuck them in and put baby on the breast and then settle in and put our boppies on and relax back and then relax into the boppy, we often get a nice deep, deep latch. So oh my again, God, incredible. It's belly to belly, chest to chest with the chin and the cheeks touching the breast. Start with the nose opposite the nipple, the thumb opposite the nose holding the breast, and then waiting for the big O mouth so that the baby can go on to the breast. Mm -hmm. I feel like that was like a poem or it could be like a bedtime story you could write. <laughs> it was very poetic sounding. Yeah. Um, we got a live question from Amber about weaning. Amber, we're going to come back to weaning towards the end of the program. So I'm going to put it for a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> weaning is, is a challenge all on its own. So it I know that there's always a lot of concern by new moms about how they can tell if they're making enough milk. What tips yeah. do you have for kind of managing milk supply? Well, the first thing is, is that moms need to recognize when the baby is feeding versus non-nutritively suckling on the breast. So a baby that is feeding well on the breast, you will see a drop in the jaw and a pause. So they'll go suck, 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 swallow, suck, 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 swallow, suck, swallow, suck, swallow, suck, swallow. And you'll be able to see that movement right here in the little jowl. And you'll hear a little sound. It sounds like a very, very tiny. When babies are sucking and swallowing really well, they'll feed on one breast for a while and you can use the baby's body as a barometer for how well the feeding is going. When babies are hungry, they keep their hands high and tight like this. And when they start to get milk, they'll go like, they'll start to open their hands like this and then they'll relax. And when they've gotten some milk, it'll come down to about the nipple line here. And when they're done on the first side, you can usually pick up their arm and drop it down by their diaper and they're good and fed from one side. But little newborn babies need multi-course meals with each breast being like one of the courses of the meals. So I always tell mothers, start with the first side, that's like an appetizer. Don't be surprised if your baby wants a salad plate. They might need to then rest and digest and then come back from main course over here. And if they're still hungry, offer them dessert. It's okay to switch back and forth multiple times until your baby really does say I'm done. And at the beginning, when babies are new at feeding, they often feel full before they're fully fed. So we might sometimes have to switch back and forth a couple of times. But as they become more efficient with feeding, you'll start to notice that they feed really well on one side, they go to the other side, and then they're generally done. You can know that you have enough milk if your baby regains their birth weight by the second week, they're having at least six wet diapers by day of life six. And they have at least three to four poopy diapers. And the poop should be a nice yellow color after day five. And then as long as baby is growing and the baby's feeding a minimum of eight times on both breasts and you can hear the sucks and swallows, that's the best measure of whether or not you have enough milk. Um, and it would be really great if our breasts like shined a, a bright pink color as soon as all of the milk had transferred or like we knew that somehow like you know there was lines on our breasts that said two ounces have come out or something um, but I always tell mothers that they the best judge of whether or not the baby is getting enough is the baby mm -hmm. and learning your baby's cues for fullness are just as important as learning their feeding cues totally totally um those are great tips I I did have a baby scale here and I remember like I was methodically tracking like did I feed from the right boob or the left boob and trying different hacks like putting a clothespin on my bra strap so I could keep track of which side I'd bet on yeah. last and 
using all these tracking apps, but it feels like a lot of the tips that you just shared really kind of tune into the mother's intuition and like being able to like know your baby and see their signs and, and like just use your intuition a little bit more than like all of the technology sometimes, right? People have been doing this for right. long before we had smartphones. <laughs> and I think a lot of people, exactly. And that's an important thing that you just said, Jennifer. Um, parenting is not rocket science. So like you, if you care about your child, you are competent to be this child's parent, right? Mm -hmm. So the other important thing is, is that the clock can't tell you if the feeding was effective. And many parents will be get, given advice that says feed for 15 minutes on each side. But oftentimes the babies feed really well for five minutes and fall asleep. And then we wait 10 minutes. Then we put them to the other side. They feed for five minutes, they fall asleep and they didn't get fully fed. So my I baby, always, we said she had instant boob sleepiness. Like literally the yes. second you put on the boob, she did half that. I was like, come on, wake up for putting ice cubes have, on her face. <laughs> yeah, we have to stimulate them and keep them actively feeding. That's very common, a very common problem in the first couple of weeks. So the best person to tell you if the feeding was effective is the baby. And a mother who tunes into her baby's behavior at the breast is more likely to have a well-fed baby. When she can say, yeah, that was a good feed. I heard the baby was gulping at the breast. I could see the milk that was coming out the side of the mouth, right? There was so much milk. Then we, we generally know that's a mother who's in tune, but a lot of times they just look at the clock and they're not looking at the baby. And so I always redirect mothers towards their babies and teach them how to assess themselves so that they can feel confident themselves. Absolutely. And so uh, Jessica had another question, which is, do you have to burp the baby after breastfeeding? Oh, that's a great question. So burping is really kind of a bottle feeding behavior. And it, and it comes from a time when we had to feed lots of babies bottles in the nursery. And babies will, if they get fed very fast, will need to burp in between breasts. But I usually see it more as a waking up the baby so the baby can feed on the other side. Mm -hmm. So what I would generally say is, remember when that multi-course meal, we might be feeding on this side for a little while. And then the baby relaxes and almost looks like they're asleep. Um, and I might compress my breast and I might stimulate, but I'm not hearing any more swallows. So then I might want to take the baby off, bring my baby up this way and rub up the back just to get the baby stimulated to see if the baby's still hungry and wanted to feed some more. I also like bringing my baby into a forward position like this, kind of in a seated position, because if any air needs to come up, it will come up on its own. Babies are totally competent. Like we don't have to manually remove air. They're so right. competent. If they need to burp, it'll come out if we just give them a minute. Now, a lot of parents will ask me, do I need to do it for some prescribed time? Like I must burp for 15 minutes to make sure that the air comes out. No, I don't think so. And especially I don't want to disrupt the baby's sleep cycle. Mm -hmm. So often babies will eat, then they'll have an activity like I need to burp or I need to poop or I need to pee or I need to rest and digest. And then they'll eat again, go to the other side. And oftentimes at this, after this feeding on this side, they want to go to sleep. Mm -hmm. And if you burp them, then you just disrupt their ability to go to sleep. So I always say maybe burp between breasts, but unless your baby's wiggly at the breast and is actually telling you I need something to be different, I would only burp in between breasts. Got it. That makes sense. Um, yeah. What is dream feeding and how often should moms be nursing at night? Yeah, so that's a great question. Babies, remember, need to wake frequently to feed frequently so that they can socialize and learn. And that's the core message of my baby behavior class that I teach. It's important for babies to be waking about every three to four hours at nighttime up and through the 12th week of life. It's very normal. And especially in the first six weeks after a baby is born, you're going to find that their days and nights are mixed up. So if you're pregnant right now, people, chances are you probably lay down around 10 o'clock and your baby gets really active, right? Starts to move around because all day long you're moving and you're doing what we call repetition to soothe, which means the baby is being kind of lulled into a, a happy state, right? A kind of a relaxed, quiet sleep state. And then they come alive and are very active often from midnight to 8 a.m. And that's a typical normal newborn pattern. So after your baby is born, expect them to want to feed a lot from midnight to 8 a.m. And it'll take six weeks of exposure to sunlight for them to get their days and nights sorted out. Mm -hmm. So for them, there's 24 hours in a day. 
They're often feeding every two to three hours from midnight to 8 a.m. and sleeping slightly longer stretches during the day. So get some of your sleep during the day and expect that it's six weeks that that's gonna shift. So partners, partners can be super helpful at 6 a.m. After the, a marathon feeding session from midnight to 6 a.m. Partners, you can grab the baby and you can take the baby out. You can be Mufasa and put Simba up to the sky and say, this is the sun, you know, good morning, hello. Um, we can do a little bit of early morning sunlight so that the baby starts to develop their own uh, melatonin stores so that the baby will start to feel tired in the evening. And you'll notice that this behavior will shift. At three weeks, babies go through their first growth spurt. And you'll start to notice a daily period of fussiness, usually in the afternoon and evening. We call that the witching hour, right? We used to call <laughs> it the grandmother's hour because we used to live in villages and you could just pass out your baby to the grandmother and grandma would take baby. Um, but usually right around dinner time, or I call it the rule of threes. The first three days of life are hard. The first three weeks are really tricky. And then around week three, your baby likes to have um, a, a growth spurt with, that's usually characterized by three hours of fussy behavior after 3 p.m. every day. Um, and those growth spurts come every three weeks at three, six, nine, and 12 weeks. And you can expect this behavior. And that's really great because if you are getting this behavior, your baby is normal. And that means your baby's growing up and that your baby's feeding well, your baby's growing well. So expect that, that to happen. And then babies will start to stretch their sleeps at nighttime around six weeks. They also stop pooping at night, which is super awesome because less diaper changes. And it, what's another really super great thing is that uh, they'll start to have a longer stretch of sleep. So they may sleep really well from say seven to midnight. So dream feeding is this concept that you can get that longest stretch of sleep, that four or five hour stretch of sleep when you want it. So you might want to disrupt that seven to midnight feeding by doing a 10 o'clock dream feed and trying to get your longest stretch from say 10 until two in the morning or three in the morning. Mm -hmm. I don't really recommend trying to alter it too much before 12 weeks because you remember your baby every three weeks is going through a bunch of these changes. And so trying to throw in a dream feed sometimes just disrupts the baby's natural ability to sleep five hours. And it's better for them to learn how to sleep five hours first before we try to change it up. So in my opinion, set your sights on the 12 week mark. It takes a 12 pound baby to have a liver large enough to hold enough glucose to feed the brain for a six hour stretch. Wow. And most newborns aren't 12 pounds until they're about 12 weeks. All right, that's great. All right, well, I wanna make sure we get to Amber's question before uh, we run out of time. So sure. uh, Amber has a two-year-old or near almost two-year-old and he's obsessed with the boobs. He's very attached. She is stressed about how is she going to wean him? Do you have any tips? I, I My personal weaning experience, I feel like people don't talk about it enough that you have like a big hormonal drop. And I, I feel like in hindsight, I had like a, a little bit of depression not after I had the baby, but actually when I stopped breastfeeding is when I really yeah. personally experienced that hormonal drop. So I think I, I would like to share that experience with other people to like, be prepared that sometimes like this idea of postpartum depression can actually happen much later than postpartum. No, that's really important to know. It's really true that actually weaning or actually premature weaning. So for example, if you didn't get to meet the breastfeeding goal that you wanted to, uh, you wanted to meet, sometimes that can trigger a postpartum episode, it's important to always be talking to your provider and to have a plan in place. So weaning, weaning, I love weaning. I love talking about weaning uh, because you're right. It isn't discussed. It's like we get them started and then how do we finish this up? <laughs> weaning begins, weaning is a process, not an event. And it begins when we begin giving table foods to our baby. So as soon as we start introducing table foods, we have begun the weaning process. So, over time, your baby will start to eat and breastfeeding becomes secondary over time. So usually right around the first year, many mothers are, are thinking about how they can scale back their feeds at the breast. And it really becomes more of like a, a, like a, a token experience, like before a, a nap or before going to bed at night or one of those experiences. The best recommendation I have for weaning is don't ask don't refuse and distract, distract, distract. <laughs> so many times if you don't wanna feed at that morning wake up, that means that you need to distract by getting up yourself and starting the day by getting breakfast started. 
not having the breasts exposed or being laying down in the bed together. Oftentimes we get up and we cuddle with our babies and they think, oh, well, that means it's time to nurse, right? Yeah. So you have to then just bring them out to the kitchen and get your day started. Um, but also don't refuse because frequently babies sometimes really do need that additional feed. Um, and it isn't always about feeding because breastfeeding also can be about the immune system. So my other great recommendation about weaning is wean in the spring, not during cold and flu season. So when you wean in spring, you get your baby through the next cold and flu season. And you'll be shocked at how really critical it is to your baby's health. Right now with COVID-19, for those of you at, who have a two-year-old right now, who might be thinking, I'm not really sure I wanna do this anymore. I would say, think about cold and flu season and maybe consider continuing to breastfeed just until the springtime. Because oftentimes uh, springtime and summer bring activities where we can go out and we can really do those distraction things. But right now with being at home, you may find yourself really stuck with things that, you, you know, not having a lot of activities. So if you're still on the fence about it, I would say wean, wean in spring. And if you're really set, like I'm done, then I would do don't ask, don't refuse and distract, distract, distract. I love it. I think we've been hearing a lot of stories about moms who've actually been able to exceed their breastfeeding goals because of COVID. So maybe yes. this is one silver lining where they're not having to go to work, they're not having to pump as much, and they're really able to extend their breastfeeding um, time with their children because they're home more. So yeah. I think that that's been awesome. Um, well, I know we're out of time, so I just want to quickly um, talk for one minute about some of the best Boppy products uh, since yeah. they are our host today. I was a Boppy user myself. I really think that Boppy is synonymous with this category of breastfeeding pillows um, because they have the original one and it's won all of these awards um, over the last three decades, uh, supporting moms, dads, and babies. And it you know, can provide a lot of relief for your arms and back by lifting that baby up uh, yeah. you know, to reach the breast so that you aren't having to hold them. I remember I was getting like shoulder cramps, I'm, like trying to hold my baby like this and my shoulder was going way up before I really got the hang of using the pillow. Um, yeah. And I also love that they're machine washable. My daughter spit up on everything. I mean, oh my gosh, those first six months, I was constantly changing clothes five times a day because everything yes. was covered in spit up. So washable pillows are also great. Um, and then Bobby actually has um, their best latch breastfeeding pillow, which was created for nursing moms of all body types. And I just love the inclusivity of it. It's got a wider middle and some extra height so that plus size and tall women can have the support where it's needed the That's most. Great. Um, and it gives like a lot of firmness to help you get that newborn latch success um, and an adjustable belt to help you keep it in place while you're working. So uh, really a big fan of the Boppy product. Uh, we actually have a coupon code today, which is WBW10 for World Breastfeeding Week, uh, which just wrapped up on Saturday. Uh, so anybody who wants to use WBW10, you get 10% off on Bobby.com for the entire month of August. Um, so thank you so much, Genevieve, for yes. joining us today. I know you're so busy with all of the many initiatives that you are involved in helping women breastfeed everywhere. And yes. um, I just really loved all of your anecdotes today. This was super wonderful and helpful. So thank you so much and uh, yes, look forward to talking again soon. Happy World Breastfeeding Week. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. And he was gone.